When you watch an old episode of The Kids in the Hall, Mark McKinney is often the hardest to recognize and the hardest to forget. Are you going to watch? Well, if it doesn't take too long. Oh, great! <laughs> More than anyone else from the show, Mark could step into a character and simply disappear. Don't worry about me. I mean, I'm only crushing your heads. Now, that talent comes from a real, if unlikely, place. The son of a diplomat, Mark moved around every couple of years, had the kind of childhood that allowed you to constantly reinvent yourself. The kind of childhood that could really prepare you to be an actor, if you so choose. Now, Mark and the rest of the kids came together in the comedy clubs in Toronto back in the 80s, 84 specifically. It was Lorne Michaels, the producer of Saturday Night Live, who helped the kids get their own TV show. And for the kids in the hall, very little was taboo. Hey, Butch, what would you do if there was a cure tomorrow? Wow. Well, I'd probably get really wrecked, and then I'd go out and do as many guys as I could. But for Mark, the kids were really just the beginning. In 95, he became a cast member on SNL, spent three seasons on the show, then returned home and continued to grow as a writer on shows like Slings and Arrows, which is a masterpiece. My God, the life you've led. Michael, Tuesdays and Thursdays, another great show, and is one of the driving forces behind the acclaimed comedy, Less Than Kind. Give your brother a hug. Dad? Wouldn't kill you to give him a hug. What? Oh my God, I can't get my arms <laughs> They're so fat. And as the show enters its third season, Mark and the cast are coping with the sudden death of their lead actor, the great Maury Chaikin. And together, they'll deal with the age-old question, can great comedy come from great loss? Please welcome back, Mark McKinney. It is... Dollars. These are great. Yeah, this is the uh, <laughs> for the World Food Program, right? You want to fill the cup. It's, oh, good. It's not budget cuts. Yeah, that's, yeah, no, that's, that's right. Great. It's not budget cuts. That's no. great. World Food Program. It's the mm -hmm. red cup. Uh, congrats on the season. I, I mean, I, I, it's always exciting if you get season three, less than kind. Obviously, a great it's show. It's rare error, Yes, it, it is. But then this is just such a uh, a tough one in a sense. You know, the loss of Maury Chaikin. I mean, yeah. Tell me about the decision to go on. I can't imagine that was an easy one. Uh, no, it, it, it wasn't because there's certainly no imperative to say you know you have to go on, particularly you know when. Uh, when someone like you lose someone like Maury, but um, you know we'd manufactured a show or we'd come up with a show about a, a family that was very real to us, and and uh, Maury had been ill but was on the mend, and so this really what came out of the blue, and uh, after you know two or three weeks of just wondering what we we're going to doing, I mean the first sort of creative idea came, which was it should happen to the family. There's something beautiful about about what happens on the day when you get really really bad news. You're going somewhere else. You got lunch. You got dinner. You got plans. You're going to go to college, and then everything changes. And that was, became a really compelling reason to write the show. And also for us, the writers and the cast and the producers, it was a way to sort of work out our, our grief about it. Also, that's what I wondered. How did you yeah. how did you work the grief out with them? Like, what what was it, do you have, you know, when, when someone dies in a school, they talk about therapy. Did you guys have group conversations? What's the process like? Um. Well, you know, we're a lot of us in the room are comedians, so there's a lot of gallows humor and and stuff like that. And uh, it's such an interesting place the mind goes, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and come on, who's not laughed their ass off at a funeral mm. once or twice? <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah. It just the tension breaks and there's tears and there's laughter and it's a it's a super frothy moment. And, yeah. and and it was no different on our show. We just kind of found a way to sort of like reconnect with each other. And our first read through when the, the whole cast showed up and we all just stood up and held hands and we're just grateful that we got a chance to do it. It it was a was a a perverse positive, let's call it that. Sure. Yeah. That's probably something more it would have dug, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it, if you think Canadian comedies or Canadian television in general just at a different place than they were, if you think about what Slings and Arrows was able to do, and yeah. now, you know, your show, you got Michael's Tuesdays and Thursdays, like you're starting to yeah. see Canadian shows not just be good, but have that extra layer. That other thing that makes them like, even the critics like them. Yeah, yeah. You know, do you sense that something's changing? Oh, I do. I very much do. It's a different business than when I first uh, came into it. There's so many good writers and so many good shows. And then, of course, being Canadian, it's sort of like, you know, uh, the shows I tended to watch were more CBC, BBC kind of comedy or shows uh, uh, growing up. It's kind of like we were what the U.S. cable market is doing before the U.S. cable market happened. Right. We were interested in the quirky, the underdog, the weird, the offbeat, and, uh, and, and also sort of like the, as smart as possible. There was no stigma to that, you know, if, if it was shown on the CBC. Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays, miraculous show. How good it is from the jump, you know. I think and, it started uh, with Slings and Arrows. I think yeah. Slings and Arrows is an incredible show when I first saw hey, it. I wrote on that. I know, yeah. I know. But, I, but one thing I've started to notice, though, is that... <laughs> You've popped up on a lot of these shows. Right, and in Canada, right. we tend to hire the same three people to run everything. Right. So you've popped up on a lot of these shows. Do you make a conscious choice to say, hey, listen, 
we're, this is where we're taking these shows. This is what I think we should do with these shows. I've been a major or minor participant in, in some, what I think are some really good shows, but I emphasize also minor, you know, uh, um, and yeah, maybe I'm, I, do you think I'm six degrees of Kevin Bacon for you Canadian show business today? Yeah. In a lot of ways. That'd be very cool. I was thinking about yeah. you uh, when you were coming back on the show, the, the, your SNL days, and I thought you're one of the very few guys who got a chance to work on SNL who didn't have to audition. Like you yes, just, I walked on. Yeah, Lauren just hired you. Yeah, what an idiot. What was the di <laughs> <laughs> No, because I sucked. I sucked. It was, uh, it was really funny because when I went to SNL, at the end of five years of Kids in the Hall, my characters were getting really, really tiny and really, really weird. And SNL's a great show, but it's not about that. You know what I mean? So, did anyway. you try the chicken lady on SNL? I did try the chicken lady, and I had to take out 90 seconds as I'm walking in a chicken suit to the stage, just kind of like with the pen going, <laughs> and, then, and of course it kind of bombed. So... Uh, uh, but, but why were the characters becoming more minor? On, on were you just going down a writer? I think writers? it was just you, you know you follow that rabbit hole when you're when you're writing and and Kids in the Hall was very free form, very creative. We kind of were allowed to do whatever the hell we wanted, you know. So ages ago you said that what well, wasn't that many? Maybe three years ago you said that based on the political reality here and other things, you just didn't feel safe in this country in your job. Um, yeah. Is that accurate? I don't mean like they're hunting you down. Maybe they are. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's always weird in Canada because, you know, there's this huge X factor, which is like, what do people in government think about funding the CBC, for instance? And that can become a real sort of, particularly if you like to work on, on a certain specific kind of show, you know, it can, it can, the water could be high or it can be very low. But I think the business is maturing. I think that Canada, you know, Canadian television is, is, is just inches away from breaking out with a string of programs that'll be hits uh, across North America. But the Canadian identity is changing too, isn't it? I think yeah. there's a lot, for the longest time, the people in control of the Canadian stories right. were reflective of the Canadian people. Yes. The Canadian people have changed. The dynamic has changed more than the people telling the stories have changed. Do you feel that, that you know, like, still networks are run by the same people in a sense, uh -huh. but Canada's different than it used to be. Oh, completely. You know? It's not the same country at all. I, it's, uh, it's funny, it's, I, I just got an iPad. And uh, they have this thing called Tweets Near You or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And you can listen to the conversations, people tweeting at 3 in the morning, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's an insane mosaic. I can't put the damn thing down. Yeah, you get yeah. that you just kind of hold it up, and you see all the things that are happening in your vicinity. Yeah, yeah. But does that change the way you write? Do you, ever, do you look at that and say, maybe I could start building stories around this? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, well, that's modern reality. I, what I more tend to think about is the idea that, you know, um, Canadians, we have this huge disadvantage culturally from any other English-speaking country in the world in that New Zealanders have an accent, Australians have an accent, English people have an accent. It helps them buy their own stories and invest in them and put up a little bit of a cultural firewall, if you will. Like in Quebec, they have hit movies that make massive profits where our industry struggles because we look and sound a lot like Americans. And right. we have the same taste, though we are different. But the thing is, there's a fantastic opportunity to take our lemons and make lemonade with that thing. Yeah. Which we do, I think it's we're true. starting to do. I think we do see our voices more just based on accent and, and culture, don't we? So yeah. we actually yeah. hear ourselves in a lot of the American stories. Right, yeah. Do you think, though, that there's a workaround for that? Like, I do. For the audience? Yeah. For the audience, you Yeah, because the like, audience is the one that we need to really buy into this, right? I do. I think, I think that, you know, the kind of business which is around now, which is sort of like a hybrid, you've got everything from Flashpoint to Michael's Tuesdays and Thursdays to Less Than Kind to this show, which there was no version of a Strombolopolis show except on radio yeah. when I first started listening to the CBC and stuff like that. And I think, I think it's just going to gradually expand. I think, like, there's a generation of writers and directors and, and performers who are really kind of going, hey, maybe I don't have to leave Canada. There's interesting stuff happening here. Do you feel like you're in a position where you need to mentor people? Uh, if they want to be mentored, you like the last thing you want to do is mentor someone who doesn't want to mentor you. <laughs> you to mentor them, I mean. Yeah. Have you had people try to do that to you over no, your No, you just find a guy on the street and say, I'm going to mentor you, and he's like, get away from me, buddy. I don't know you. <laughs> Stick around, we're going to yeah. find out if Mark was once the, uh, the first, one of the first advocates uh, for girl power. Anthropology with Mark McKinney after this. All right. Hey, baby, here's where we get high concept. Eight miles high. A Royal Air Force stealth bomber is hijacked by a group of extraterrestrial terrorists. Inside the pilot's pocket is a computer disk with a virus encoded on it that is so deadly it could destroy the world. The British Prime Minister has absolutely no choice. He has to call in the Spice Force 5. <laughs> We're back here with Mark McKinney. 1997, Spice World. Yep. The Spice Girls movie, which 
was remarkably good. Yes. Were you, how did you get involved in a Spice Girls movie? Barnaby Thompson, who produced the Kids in the Hall uh, movie Brain Candy, had uh, returned to England and wound up doing, yes, go ahead, let it loose for Brain Candy. Uh, <laughs> can't believe I did that. I, don't mind. I just pimped myself. You didn't so. do it, man. Okay. Um, anyway, so he was, a, he was a producer, and he called me up one day and said, well, Ma, would you like to be in the Spice Girls movie? And I said, all right. And I went over, <laughs> and it was fantastic. It was a great experience. And George went, became a really good friend. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And Richard's in that as well, right? Richard, oh, just, yeah, he was a god to Fantastic me. Fantastic actor. Um, all right, so based on that, who would have been your favorite Spice Girl? If I would have been sporty at the time, who would you have been you? Uh, oh, I, I don't think I'm Scary Spice. Well, maybe I am Scary Spice. No. Uh, <laughs> Baby Spice. Who's the one that left? Ginger Spice. Ginger. I would be Ginger Spice. Jerry Halliwell, right over yeah, there. All right. Yeah. So, uh, which? So, I guess Ginger best describes you. If all the kids in the Hall cast members were lost at sea and starving to death, which one would you eat first? Oh. <laughs> See, this is stuff that could happen. Okay. It wouldn't be. It, uh, yeah. No, it's true. Uh, Bruce, Scott, and I would be the most savage. Uh, so we would survive. So it's either Dave or Kevin that's going to get you. The first one's out. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let me play a scene here and see if uh, you were nervous doing this. Let's okay. take a look at the scene here. You know, people pay attention when I walk into a room. And hey, maybe I'll get a different type of fan mail now. <laughs> that, <laughs> no matter how confident you are, right? and I've been to the tapings of the show, there's an audience. Yeah. What's that moment like for you? Well, uh, revealing my X-shaped penis was really, um, <laughs> it was something I needed to do for me. You have a big black X-shaped penis, right? yeah. That's and it's like, no. I was so sorry, I'm so moved. Those were my abs. I haven't seen them in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you ever get nervous on stage? Uh, not, not, not once you get into it. No. Do you? Uh, no, I don't, I ne but I never did. I, 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 don't, maybe I, I get just nervous like... public speaking. On SNL, did you have any nerves when you went on yes, SNL? Yes, SNL made me nervous really? as a play. I've always liked sort of film or theater. Oddly enough, like uh, Kids in the Hall used to tape live, SNL tapes live. Uh, it was, I was never like quite fully relaxed for that. But on theater, theater, when it, where you really have no safety net, uh, I kind of like that. You know, Jay Moore's book, he talks about being on SNL and how he yes. used to keep uh, like uh, pills. Big farter, Jay Moore. Is he really? We used to share a dressing room. Big farter. Big farter? Huge. Like was, terrible ones? Yeah, terrible. Like, like aggressive, <laughs> like I'm a tough guy. <laughs> Take that. I, if you like me, you'll like this, you know, kind of thing. Did you just did you just laugh it off but secretly just go, what a dick? Did you do that? <laughs> I like Jay. I think he's a really. But he talked guy. about how he, he, you know, dealing with panic attacks, that he would keep uh, like a clozapan or a pill that would yeah. um, that calm down. Then he found out later that a lot of the performers did. Did you have a trick? Not necessarily drugs. What? Did you have a trick? God damn! I wish I'd known that. <laughs> The pills. That's what I'm gonna be funny. You, you have your own. It was like no I, one offered me pills. I think, well, dude, because no one wanted to admit that they were vulnerable in that moment. Did you have anything that you would do? No, you want nothing. No, I'd, I'd, you know, I drink a half bottle of wine as soon as uh, we did the good nights. But that was usually <laughs> that's about it. What's the thing you miss the most about living in New York? Oh, New York. Oh my God, just walking. Well, New York is is like uh, the best walking city in the world. Well, Toronto's really good, though. Yeah. I have to say, Toronto's a great walking city. Sure but New York, I, I miss that. I miss that. And and your odds of finding a great meal if you spin around three times and point, there will be a restaurant where you'll find something you really like. What is the thing about your TV show, Kids in the Hall, that you just hate that people keep bringing up? Uh. uh Almost nothing. It's all faded into a good, happy memory. Uh, there, I, I can't think of anything that I kind of go, oh, don't ask that. You know, I really can't. No, it's you. That's a license to do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> whatever you want, you can do. Thanks for coming back, man. It's Thank great you, to man. see you. Appreciate really it. Really appreciate that. Season three of Less Than Time this Sunday on HBO Canada. That's the premiere. Make sure you check it out. Mark, let's get it. Be right back. Thank you.